Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and buckle your seatbelts because we're rolling 401ks with the pros. How does a rollover work? Why would you do one? Why wouldn't you? Either way, how should you invest the money? To help you know when to roll and when to hold, we welcome the woman behind Sensible Money, CFP, Dana Onspa. And the woman who's way more comfortable with rollovers than she is with pop culture, Afford Anything's Paula Pant. And rounding out our panel, it's our resident 401k expert and CFP, OG. But that's not all. Halfway through the show, you'll hear our contributors try to outwit each other as they take on my traversing trivia question. And now, a guy who's never met a rollover conversation he didn't like, it's Joe Saul Hi. Hey, Doug, you know what? I was thinking about that. Rollover conversation, I think you're right. Turnover conversations like the cherry turnover where the cherries are all like tart and sweet and it's just not but an apple turnover is a good one apple turnover is a fine dessert item yes fantastic fan but unfortunately we're not the bar <laughs> that's, that is bar bar night with joe it's incredibly exciting absolutely Hey, everybody, welcome to uh, Let's Turn This Into a Food Podcast Instead of Money. I am Joe Salci. I average Joe Money on Twitter. And we have, as you heard Doug so eloquently say, an all-star lineup. And let's start with the guy across the card table from me. Mr. OG is here. How are you today, my friend? It's another Friday, so let's do it. It is. What a great way to go into the weekend, thinking about maybe getting that 401k money in the right place. And from Manhattan... The woman who, when she's not on a Netflix special, she's here with us. <laughs> Paula Pant is here. How are you? I am great. But, you know, I have a question. Is a, an apple turnover or a cherry turnover, any of those dessert turnovers, is that the same thing as like a, a personal pie, like kind of like what they used to sell at McDonald's? Like the, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Is Somebody, that what that is? I may or may not have eaten at a McDonald's at the airport this morning. And they actually asked me, Paul, if I wanted to add an apple pie with that, if I ah, wanted to like okay. add on. But that's so a, apparently they still have over. What is a turnover? Then? I know. Seriously, it's, what is a turnover? It's like a hot pocket with fruit. That's right. It's turned over. <laughs> so like the, the 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 crust and the fruit is on the opposite sides of where it normally would be. So you got crust okay. on top and the and the and the fruit, fruit on, on the bottom. There's no holds crust the fruit? on the bottom. A pan. Huh. You got a little more. We, we, we'll draw a diagram a little further, Paula. We <laughs> might have some other stuff we we need to talk about. I didn't think when we talk pop culture that would include that she doesn't even understand what a turnover is. And, <laughs> And the one who you can tell she describes all this stuff for a living because a hot pocket with fruit in it, I think, is a great way to go. She's walking her way through our podcast with people that aren't on YouTube with us. Uh, Dana Onsbox here. How are you? Well, I'm doing great. It's day one on my under the desk treadmill. So here I am at 0.6 miles per hour to talk about rollovers. I thought that you're, it always it looks like you're walking into the camera. Like any second, you're going to get like right up on top of it. That's right. I think you should so, speed it up a little bit. Get a little bit more, you know. Let's see. What if I, you know, let's see if I go 1.4. Oh, she's Whoa, moving now. Right. She's down. moving then, now. I've realized already at, at over one mile an hour, if you're talking, you actually I not get out of breath, but you start to feel it. So to have a conversation, you have to be a little bit slower. Doug, Doug oh. feels that way every time he just walks to the refrigerator. <laughs> it's like exhausted. <laughs> Got to sit down and take, take a breather during take that time at the, at the stairs. <laughs> Hey, Dana, let's talk about let's talk about you right now, because I saw that you're going to be joining uh, the Bogleheads conference here soon. I am in October in D.C. and super excited about it. What are you going to be speaking at the Bogleheads about? Really about retirement portfolio. So I still have to work through the presentation, but that's the general topic. But it'll be some of the stuff maybe that we're talking about today, huh? Could be. Could be. Well, we've got uh, Dana here. We're so happy she's here. We got Paula. We got OG. 
No. <laughs> it, it does not yeah, matter. And, you know, you know, gonna... I, I got to jump in and I got to fall on a sword and admit something I rarely do. I was wrong. Dana was what? right on a yeah, turnover. It's a yeah. hot pocket with fruit pocket. in it. It's like a... It's like a triangle and there's like, it's like a light puff pastry. You might've even said that Dana. So basically Doug just eats dessert upside down. <laughs> Doesn't that well, that's what my, my grandma always called it. My original guess then would have been correct. Like the, the McDonald's, the personal pie thing, right? Well, that's that's yeah. basically the shape of a turnover then, right? Well, I don't know. I just, I just looked them up and they're like I'm these with you, tri- they're triangles. Oh boy. The, the ones that all came up on my, on my Google device were all triangle shaped. So triangle not exactly. But pan? <laughs> everybody listening right now is like, it said they're talking 401k rollovers on the title of the podcast. Yeah. Can we, can we get <laughs> to the turnovers? I thought it was the conversation. Ah, turnovers. ah, that's good. So why don't we get moving on that? Dana, you know why the retirement account wanted to go bungee jumping? Why? Because it wanted to experience a real 401k rollover. <laughs> oh, no? no. No? Okay, fine. Dana, let's start with you then. Let's define this. What does it mean to roll over your 401k for people that made it this far? And they're like, I don't even know what this is. Tell us what a 401k rollover is. Yeah, it means you can transfer assets in a company, usually company-sponsored 401k plan, directly to an IRA. And if you do it correctly, then you don't have to pay the taxes. So we have people all the time saying, no, I can't take money out of my 401k at all. I'll have to pay the income taxes or a penalty tax. And we're like, no, if you do a rollover, then it is a tax-free transfer. And now your money stays tax-deferred within that IRA account. But why might you want to do that, Paula? Let's start there. Why might I want to do a 401k rollover to somewhere else? So let's say that you leave your job. Maybe you quit. Maybe you got fired because they realized you're kind of an imbecile um, for whatever reason. Because <laughs> you didn't you... <laughs> know that it was a hot pocket <laughs> right? with fruit in it. Okay. Offense taken. Right. You lose your job at the turnover company <laughs> and uh, and you don't want to have your 401k funds tied up in this account that's um, affiliated with your former employer, especially if you, you know, particularly millennials, Gen Z tend to have many employers over the span of their lives. So if you've got, you know, over the span of a career six, seven, eight employers, because you keep getting fired from the turnover factory, then uh, you're just going to have 401ks scattered with all kinds of former employers. You want to centralize your retirement funds into one account that you manage that um, isn't tied to a particular employer. And ideally, because you get to pick your IRA custodian, uh, that has the type of fund selection that you like. We'll get into what that what that phrase is, IRA custodian, what that means. But, oh, gee, mm-hmm. you know, you hear these people that are often asset gatherer, financial pros telling you, hey, that money sitting in that old 401k, you should roll that to an IRA. You should roll that to an IRA. Is that oversold or is roll it to the IRA really the best thing to do? Well, that's kind of a loaded question. I'll also add that the term rollover is a term we use kind of colloquially uh, uh, between everybody, you know, as we're talking about this. But but in reality, the IRS, of course, means a completely different thing when they say the word rollover. What we're talking about, if you really want to get in the weeds, is a trustee to trustee transfer, right? That's what we're saying is you can move it from one trustee to another, and then you don't have mm-hmm. a penalty. You can do a rollover, which is uh, actually a step in between that. A rollover is you get the money first. And then you put it back sometime later, later within the within that 60 day window, you're going to be responsible for all the taxes that they withhold to do that, though. So, you know, this is a, you know, real kind of in the weeds thing. When we say rollover, we probably mean trustee to trustee transfer. But when it comes to uh, trying to decide whether or not it makes sense, there's a lot of factors that go into that The cost structure. Paula mentioned the investment choices or the custodian. If you've got if you've got um, um a company stock in your in your plan so you're holding company stock within that plan would be a big decision point uh depending on how long you've worked there um whether or not you plan on going back there would be another reason you know liquidity when you might need the money because there's some favorable withdrawal programs for money that's in a 401k that's not the same as an ira so those are all things you got to be considered of 
Let's talk about that a little bit, Dana. What are some reasons when you're working with people as they get close to retirement that you might tell them to leave their money alone, keep it in that same 401k? Yeah, some of the same things OG said, just diving a little deeper, you know, yeah. if you are under age 59 and a half, but leave your company in the year you reach age 55, if you leave your money in that 401k plan, you have access to the funds without paying the penalty tax. You'd still have to pay income taxes on a withdrawal, but sometimes we have clients that are in that four year window. And so we'll say for liquidity provisions, you know, if you're going to need the money or might need the money in these next four and a half years, let's leave the money in the plan. That way we can take a withdrawal, no penalty tax. Another would be in specifically to the investment option. Sometimes we come across a unique option called a stable value fund or a fixed income uh, contract that's within the 401k plan. Now, particularly when interest rates were zero outside the plan, we would say, okay, you know, we can earn more on this stable value fund by leaving it in your 401k plan, you know, very low risk option. That may have changed. I haven't come across that in the last year, but that analysis would have to be looked at afresh with, with interest rates being higher now. Do you agree, Dana, with what Paula mentioned earlier that maybe having it, though, in an IRA, just largely, that's kind of the place to start? Maybe, Paula, I inferred that you said that, 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 that because it sounded like you really like the idea of IRA, all your assets in one place. Dana, you like that better for that reason as well? I like it just for the fact that people lose track of old 401ks. They forget to update their address. They forget to update their beneficiaries. The 401k plan can go through and find a new 401k provider and it goes through a blackout period. You know, there's all kinds of things that can happen and people, you know, move and, and years later, they don't even remember they had money in this old plan. And, and so, yeah, I agree in general. I think it makes sense to consolidate. And then you have to look for the particular situations where it does doesn't make sense. Well, let's go to the other one of those then. You mentioned these stable value funds that were still paying five and six percent when money was paying paying nothing. Oh gee, the other one that you mentioned though is if people have company stock in their plan. Talk about why you might want to leave that alone or at the very least not roll it to an IRA. Well, there's there's a couple of things that can happen with company stock in your 401k plan. You have a unique opportunity to have that tax differently. And there's lots of rules around it, and, and it's a very specialized uh, uh, calculation and depends on how long you've been there and that sort of stuff. Suffice it to say, if you have company stock in your 401k plan, like, for example, your company um, has a company stock fund within the plan as one of the choices, and you've just been investing in your in your you know normal weekly investing or normal uh, paycheck investing into some some amount of that company stock. Uh, you have a unique opportunity or per potentially have a unique opportunity to take that money out and pay a different tax rate, a capital gains tax rate on those dollars as opposed to an ordinary income tax rate. But there's a lot of rules around it. And and here are the highlights of it. If you have company stock, make sure you're aware of, of, of your options and you can't deal with this in the last quarter of the year. So as you get toward October, November, and you're thinking, hey, I just left my job. I've got company stock. I remember those knuckleheads on Stacking Benjamins talking about this. I'm going to try to tackle this Thanksgiving week. No chance. It's it's too involved and you have an opportunity to screw it up because there's something that has to be done before December 31 or all bets are off. So this is best used to, to think about at the beginning of the year. If you want to look it up, it's called NUA, Net Unrealized Appreciation. Let's talk for let's talk for a second because you you mentioned the tax benefits there and talked about capital gains tax versus ordinary income tax and I think OG a lot of times people don't understand what what a what a huge difference this can be sometime. Can you talk about the difference potentially in those tax rates? Well, it could be, right? I mean, cap capital gains rates are as low as 0 depending on what your income is, right? So so you could be taxed at $0 for the gain portion of that of that uh, of that stock, um, but probably fifteen, maybe twenty, or maybe twenty three. But then you just kind of kind of compare that against what the uh, what your current tax rate is, and whether or not you can afford to write the check. Because the government, you know, there's always a gimme and a gotcha to everything. The the IRS is not really big fans of going. Here's all this great stuff. They like to go. Here's this, and we're gonna smash you on the head with the hammer on this one. So. You have to be able to 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 evaluate the whole thing, but ultimately, it are just you comes saying down to whether or not? 
Yeah. Are you third. saying then if you if, are, are you saying if you do end the the net unrealized appreciation, then you have to be able to write the check that year for whatever the tax would be? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, there's going to be some taxes due. I mean, now so now you could take you know you could sell some stock to pay it or something you know, but there's there's going to be some some tax amount due, and it could be a little bit. It doesn't necessarily always have to be a lot, but it's something that you're going to want to uh, want to know what you're getting yourself into. Uh, but, uh, Paula, th- thinking about this idea of moving it over, you mentioned uh, IRA custodian. That may be a new term for people. Right. So when you're comparing the different custodians out there, what the hell are you talking about? Sure. A custodian, <laughs> a custodian is just a fancy way of saying the business, the entity, the company that holds your IRA. So think of it this way. Um, imagine that you're at a bar. You're drinking, right? There are all kinds of different glasses available. There's a martini glass. There's a pint glass. There's a um, uh, shot glass, right? Each of those glasses are different vessels and each vessel is designed for a different type of liquid inside of it. Now, that doesn't mean that you necessarily have to have a particular, you know, you can you can have a a martini glass and fill it with beer if you wanted to. I mean, most people don't, but, you know, you're free to do so. But there are just certain vessels that are kind of better for certain purposes. And uh, and and that's what you're shopping for when you're looking for an IRA custodian. I've just kind of shot this glass as like <laughs> exactly. That was I awesome. <laughs> see a bunch shot of glass. That is the kind I need. I need. A I can double. see a bunch of bunch of people after this going to their advisor and going, yeah, yeah. So what shot glass we get with this? I heard I get a shot glass. <laughs> like I roll it over. Like I go to you know I used to collect those glasses at Hard Rock Cafe. Like I heard I get a glass with this. What's what, what, what glass do you guys offer? Yeah, can I? But, but but I do like that because so so I think that Paula, what you're saying is different custodians might be better at different things. Exactly, exactly. A martini glass is better for vodka. A pint glass is better for beer. It's put in only a way I think that it's you can a- put it. Right there. <laughs> I was going to say I could argue that a pint glass is great for vodka. <laughs> Depends on how bad the recording session went that day. That's exactly, (laughs) exactly uh, right there. When we think about this, this, uh, Dana, if I've got this new job, um, is it automatic then that I don't roll to my new job? Nobody's mentioned yet, Dana, rolling the money because the IRS will also let you roll it to your new job. Why are you saying roll it to an IRA versus roll it to the new job? Well, that's a great question, Joe. You know, typically I'm working with people who are retiring and so they don't have a new job they're going to. That's it. They're done. And well, let's so say that they got let's say they got fired from one turnover factory and they're going to work at the at Paula's new vodka factory. <laughs> yep. You know, in that case, I do think it could make sense to look at what does their new 401k plan offer? What are the investment choices? What are the fees? But Depending on how close you are to retirement, if you want to use what we call an income ladder strategy, like laddered bonds or laddered CDs, those are investments you can't have within a 401k plan. So that's a consideration, like Paula said, depending on, you know, what liquid you're going to put in that that glass, right? That would depend, like, do I want all of that in my new 401k plan? What kind of options do they have? Or do I want a different selection of options that maybe they don't offer? Well, and this is why, OG, assuming, because I'm seeing you nod your head as Dana's talking, the uh, it assumes then you start, you don't start here then, you start with the plan first, right? I mean, we don't start with the different the different options inside. I didn't know how to do the analogy anymore. The it different options inside the glasses. That's all I know. It, it, yeah. You're talking about a mixed drink, right? A cocktail, oh, a, a mixed joy. drink. <laughs> but doesn't it start yeah. off with what am I in the mood for? Isn't that what it starts <laughs> off with? Yes. I had a CD dive bar in the, in the back alleys of town, or oh, I, I thought you meant upscale steak places. Dana was talking about like laddered CDs. You're saying a CD dive bar, like where they give you CDs. Ah, oh. CD. No, no. got it, got it. Oh, CD something bar. different. Yeah, CD. Bar. I don't know. But anyway, OG, we begin- I'm completely lost. <laughs> well, I think, I think that, that that if I'm if I'm exploring this, 
My point was, I think that it goes back to something you and I have talked about a lot where we don't even start with any of this stuff. We really start with where am I going? Yeah. Yeah. I think there's really a lot to be said for simplicity. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for organization and, and I know it seems really silly, especially if you're talking to somebody that's on their second job change or something, you go, listen, you want to put this in one place because you want a, a repository to collect these things because you know, you, you, you're going to lose track of them and people now I would never lose track of it. I know, I know Dana, this has happened to you because it's, because it's, because it happens to everybody I talk to where all of a sudden somebody, a client gets an email or a client gets a letter more likely from a job that says, Hey, by the way, we'd really like to start your $360 a month check. And they're like, for what? What does this mean? And, and, and you go, well, it says General Mills. Did you ever work at General Mills? Oh, God, yeah. Way back like in 78 to 83 when I was in college. Like, there you go. There's an example of we just forgot about this money that existed. Now, in that case, it, you know, or in some cases, it's like a pension or something like that. But nevertheless, it's hard to keep track of all those things if you go through all these different job changes and even career changes over your over your lifetime. So having one place where you can kind of collect all those things, I think, is going to be a lot more helpful. You see that often a lot, Dana, gardens that need to be weeded? I see it occasionally. Wouldn't say often, but certainly I've been practicing since 1995. You know, every couple of years we find someone who has what I call missing money, like money they didn't know they had. They get something in the mail. There's actually some great websites. I don't know if you can reference it in the show notes or if anyone knows them off the top of their head, like unclaimed funds websites now where you can go put in your name. Um, the first time I heard of one, I thought, well, if anyone's missing money, it's my mother. And so we found her some money. So it was great. <laughs> they're they're pretty was cool. It? You remember how uh, much it was? A couple hundred bucks, I think. And I found some for myself. So when I graduated from college at University of Florida, I moved to Colorado and I had a refund from my renters or auto insurance. I don't remember which. Didn't know. They mailed it to the address, but I had moved. And so, you know, uh, 10 years later, I'm like, oh, I have about 250 bucks sitting there. I have, I have a funny story about that. When, when, we, when we had our office in Michigan, uh, we changed suites a couple of times where, you know, suite 102 and then 210 and whatever bounced around. On a whim, my brother called me and said, I think I think you have some money from from, uh, you know, from when you were in Northville. And I said, I, I don't think so. I mean, I knew the landlord and all that sort of stuff. And he said, no, I think it's, I think it's a, like a commission check or something. So I guess, so I called this, the state and they said, well, you have to prove that it's you, you'll send us verification of your address. And I said, well, I, I don't live there anymore. You know, and it was something relatively insignificant, a hundred dollars or something like that. But it was, you know, it was fun to send the email. They said, well, if you don't, if you can't prove that that's you. And I said, I can, here's my name and here's my social. And that's probably referenced on the check somewhere. And here might be an account number or a ID number of some kind. They're like, yeah, we really need proof of proof of address. I said, how do I prove an address that I'm not at anymore? They're like, yeah, we can't help you with that. Oh <laughs> so my sometimes, really? it works. sometimes it works, but the, the state of Michigan said, no, you don't get to have your un unclaimed property. So. But I have seen it happen a number of times, Dana, like you said, with family members or something, the un unclaimed property websites, right? Any states that you've lived in or worked in, you absolutely have to Google unclaimed property for that state and, and put in your name and see what you put every put put in everybody's name that you know. You never know who's your who you're gonna find. <laughs> <laughs> I found money for my aunt, you know, like from the sixties. It was crazy. Speaking of speaking of OG dumb times when they can't quite match up a place where you used to live, how about not being able to match up your name? This is uh comedian Nate Bergazzi. Checking a bag. And the guy by the counter, he sees my ticket says Nathan, the license says Nathaniel. And he was like, this is not good. He goes, these names don't match. And I was like, but they match, right? Like, you can see the leap that we took to get from one to the other. And he was like, but they're not the same. I was like, but they're the same. And we took, we, we took a leap from Nathan to Nathaniel. Like, it's, you, you can see the leap. I know my ticket says Nathan. And my driver's license says Nathaniel. The guy's like, I don't think you know, so. And then he, and he goes on to say something like, you know, the thing that I really thought was great was when they put the picture right on the license. So with a hundred percent match on the face and like 60% match on the name, that's 160%. We're pretty much there. 
<laughs> I love his math. It's fantastic. He's so good. Coming up in the second half of this discussion, we're going to talk about now you've got your money at the new custodian and how do you invest that money? We're going to talk about investing and your 401k rollover. But for those of you that are new to the Stacky Benjamin show, we have a competition that's going on all year long between our three frequent contributors, OG Paula and uh, decorated blogger Len Penzo. Dana, today you you are playing on Team Len Penzo, and that means we've got good news and bad news. But even before we get to that, how many miles have you walked in the uh, the uh, twenty three or four minutes since we logged on? You know, about two thousand steps. So I don't okay. know, probably not not that many. That's generally one mile. Two thousand steps yeah, is generally they're a mile. really slow steps, though. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you got to get moving it. But we got good news and bad news, Dana, about where you're sitting on Team Lempenzo. Do you want the good news first or the bad news? I'll take the good news first. Guess what, Dana? The good news is you and Len are in first place because Len and everybody who's come on when he's got a week off has contributed toward eight points. And then right behind you, OG and Paula both have seven. Paula still fighting it out for the win. What's, oh yeah, that's right. You just got back last week, Paula. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. It is mine to blow. (laughs) She's like, I've got plenty of time, people. I will find my way to last place sooner or later. (laughs) But maybe not this week. Maybe Paula, who gets to guess last, gets the win. But first we need a trivia question. So Doug, what do we got on tap? Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I've been known to cruise up and down Main Street, you know, back in the day with my Vespa gang, the Flamingos. I like to be a man about town, cruising Texarkana's mean streets and looking for adventure. I'm not the only one who likes to do laps. This day in history is known for some pretty big circumnavigations. Back in 2016, NASA's Mars Odyssey completed its 60,000th orbit around Mars. One lap around the distant planet takes 18.6 hours to complete, which is exactly the same amount of time it takes Joe's mom to get ready for shrimp scampi night down at the Sizzler. But a little closer to home on this day, way back in 1931, some other pioneers were taking off from Long Island, New York to fly around the entire world, the whole planet. When they finished, they'd successfully completed the first circumnavigation by a single engine monoplane. My question is, how long did it take pilots Wiley Post and Harold Caddy to complete this epic journey? I'll be back right after I wipe down the old El Camino. It's a solid step up from my Vespa gang days. And the guy, you know, he likes to represent a certain image when he's making laps around the Tasty Freeze all night. Know what I mean? Thank you for that, Doug. And yeah, we definitely, we know what you mean, man. We know, we know what you mean. We've got, we got quite a question. You know, these people after not just lots of Benjamins, but also lots of fame, Back in the day, imagine 1931, trying to make it all the way around the world. And uh, Dana, you get to imagine first, how long did it take them to make their way around? Oh my gosh, I'm trying to do the math in my head. Is it like 24,000 miles around the globe? I can't remember, but how fast could a plane fly back then? I really don't know. So About as fast as you're walking right now. (laughs) <laughs> oh, oh, then I need to like double my initial guess if that's the case. So let's see. Let's go six and a half days. Six and a half days to make it around the world. Oh, gee, you think, uh, well, do you think that's too many or too few? So <clears throat> a clarifying question, if I may, to the judges. Um, he always is, does is, this. It, well, it's you, you just it's too ambiguous. Do you mean like how long, like actual time, you know, door to door, or do you mean like yes? I, I mean, door to door. Not, like not just for, wheels up time, or no, not door to door. I mean, obviously, Air the time. plane landed and took gas on, and then they took a nap you and all know. that sort of stuff. You mean from you don't know? Well, I, I do know. I you know so <laughs> it's so it's like it's it's like door to door time. Yeah, like Jules yeah, Verne, he runs out of okay. he runs out of the room and he starts his around the world and then he slaps the bet down just in the nick of yeah. time. Yeah. Uh golly, I was gonna say like I was gonna say six and a half days, honestly. That was gonna be my answer. So uh I have to make it challenging for Paula. I am going to say it took them thirteen days. 
13 days. But I think Dana's mm-hmm. right. Oh, is he is he is he smoke screening or is he being legit, Paula? So so my so my question. So the uh, the winner is whoever places the closest guess, correct? Closest guess. Okay. She's been on the She's show for like thirty two sure. years and she's still asking this question. <laughs> <laughs> as as opposed to it, it used to be closest without going over. Right? Paul is like, Paul is like, oh, it's closest. No wonder I suck at this. <laughs> ah, <laughs> but back oh. in the day, it was closest without going over. But, uh, but now it is simply closest, regardless of whether or not you go over. Um, so my strategy is going to be to capture the upside. So I will guess 14 days. 14 days. So, she, so you think that was a smokescreen, that he yeah. doesn't. That he does not think really that well, Dana's on it. You know, I'm I'm thinking of the whole you know around the world in eighty days kind of a. I just I was I was thinking it would be a longer period Wasn't of time. That so. a hot air balloon though. It was a hot air balloon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But still, it was it's, it's everything. Whole... So close. It was. <laughs> they were in all kinds of stuff, weren't they? On trains. I mean, they were in all kinds of crazy. They're things. probably walking on a standing desk treadmill. Stage, stage <laughs> yeah. coaches. Yeah, that's right. Standing desk. <laughs> Day seventy eight. They're like, oh crap, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> what is going on? Got to move. Hyperloop after that. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of move, we're gonna hyperloop uh, and be right back. Dana, you kicked this off with six and a half days. Everybody else went significantly higher. How are you feeling? I'm feeling okay. <laughs> all right. She's like, I'm all right. I could stop walking, but you know. Uh, oh, gee. You got the, well, not your knees capped. What? You got the, your head chopped off? I don't know I mean, what I'm, the analogy yeah. would be. Yeah. Paula took I think, the upside. I think, what are you thinking? I know. I, I love Dana's answer. I honestly had quickly done the math in my head and was like six and a half, seven days. It's probably about right. And and I uh, I just had to put some space there. So I think I think there Dana's you go. This one. But Paula, if it is 80 days, you've got it. Yeah. You know, 14, I mean, my strategy is basically just uh, just capture. Yeah, I, I figure I've captured a wide berth. So yes. you will see how yes. that plays out. That strategy hasn't worked in five years so <laughs> what's that definition of insanity i'm just gonna keep doing it right but this could be the day who knows D- well one person knows doug knows doug who's our winner i absolutely do know joe hey there stackers i'm cruise captain and town trotter joe's mom's neighbor doug and my trivia question today is based on the historic flight of the winnie may a single engine monoplane that flew all the way around the world Well, today's trivia question could have easily been which one of the pilots had the weaker bladder or who made the sweet mixtape for the journey. Our trivia committee decided that the actual question should be how long did it take pilots Wiley Post and Harold Caddy to complete their journey? Well, Paula was off by six and a half days. OG was off by five and a half days. They were both over. Dana was under by two and a half days because the answer is that while the around the world in 80 days took, you know, like 80 days, we've covered that, Post and Caddy's trip took just over 10% of that time, or eight days, 15 hours, and 51 minutes. But they made 14 stops along the way, probably at Bucky's for some corn nuts, right? So that means Dana, really Len, is our big winner. Nice job, Dana. All right, but, but did they have tapes in 1931? I, but that's who cares they just brought the band with them they just brought the band with them have have we ever let the truth get in the way of our trivia questions who knows well maybe maybe except for the uh the answer is always truthful but the rest might be mythology or there was bucky's have you been to a bucky's dana Never. I never heard of Bucky's. Paul, have you been to a Bucky's? Oh. I have. I have been to a Bucky's on a trip to Texas. Joe I'll tell you, when we were on the book tour last year and we were in, I think it was Houston, we recorded in your hotel room. And when we got there on your bed were a bunch of things from Bucky's. Some listener had brought you a bunch of stuff from Bucky's. Do you remember this? It was uh, Paul Lambert from the uh, uh, Five Lighter podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And 
you were on some of uh, one of your stupid health kicks. You're like, I can't eat the stuff. You guys take it. And I snatched it up as fast as I could. And one of the things I snatched changed our family's life, really, our trajectory, because it was chocolate covered espresso beans. And holy <laughs> shit, are those good. Unbelievable. <laughs> and. I, I tried to like, I, I, I rationed myself. I didn't eat them all. They came home. They made it to the freezer. Well, the Finn turn came back home for a weekend and inhaled them. We got in a big fight. I got, you know, I was really mad at him for eating all the Bucky's espresso beans. But ever since then, I've been buying him Bucky's espresso beans for birthdays and Christmases and <laughs> all of that them stuff. On the so internet. It's Who's not like them off the us? internet. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good. You're welcome. It's a whole thing. You're welcome. Thanks, Paul Lambert. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dana, next time you're driving through Texas, you got to make sure that you stop is by it, a bus. It's a restaurant? Is it like a convenience store? What is it? It's a gas station. Yes. A it's a way of life. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> it's a it gas is, station that has probably 150 gas pumps with an attached grocery store. The cleanest mm-hmm. bathrooms you've ever seen on the road ever in your life. With fresh mm-hmm. barbecue and t-shirts, rarely, and Yeti's rarely and aligned at the checkout. And rarely wow. aligned at the checkout counter. It is. It is a Texas-sized gas station. Yes. Wow. Uh, yeah. Think of a Walmart with a bunch of gas pumps out in front of it. <laughs> but they're growing. I mean, they're not just Texas anymore. They're kind of getting in like the whole Southeast. They're moving yeah. over that way. So okay. growing. Ooh, Bucky's near you. But Bucky's, if you want to sponsor the show, we just spent four minutes talking about you. So uh, send me the yes. beans. Joe at stackybenjamins.com if you'd like to sponsor us. Hey, speaking of sponsors, our sponsor for this episode is depositaccounts.com. You know what happens, Dana, when you go to depositaccounts.com? I don't know. Tell me. You, you find out that those interest rates you're getting from your regular brick and mortar bank might not be the best. As we record this, which is just over a week before people hear it, uh, top 1% average on savings accounts in the USA, 4.4%. The national average, still only 0.4%. CD rates, top 1% average, 5.33. National average, 3.39. Checking accounts, top 1% average, 2.27. Money markets, 4.28%. They just compare all the different rates out there. If you go to depositaccounts.com, you can see where you stand up when it comes to those banking products you use every day. Depositaccounts.com. All right, let's head into this. So how then, Dana, do I get a 401k? Lo- uh, for a, well, wow, easy for me to say. How do I get a 401k rollover? There we go. Rolling. What do I got to do to start making that happen? Let's talk paperwork. Yeah, so sometimes you can go on to your plan sponsor's website and initiate it from there. We usually like to do phone calls, so we will call you know with the client on the phone and talk to a representative. I'll give you an example. I sometimes I do web meetings. I did one with a retired CPA a few weeks ago. Her former employer had switched four hundred one k plans. We went on the website and we processed it all, and then nothing happened for weeks. And so I would talk to client, hey, you've got to call them, you've got to call and check them. And somehow it just got stuck in their system. So when you process it online, it went to someone for review and then no one hit the button to release the funds. So, I mean, a phone call is great because you're talking to a live person. Of course, if that live person doesn't hit the button and, and, you know, make it happen, you can still get things that get stuck in the process. I haven't been a financial planner in a long time. Dana, for both you and OG, does that happen? Like what percentage of the time does that happen? Because when I, when I stopped, what, 14 years ago now, it it was, it was like 20% of the time that story, Dana, would happen. You know, I don't, I I would say a lot less, you know, maybe 5%. um, But there's all the kinds of other things that can happen. You know, you've had, we've had clients who have both Roth 401ks and regular, but the company, you know, messes up and sends the wrong check to the client deposits them in the wrong account and that has to get corrected. We've had checks from inherited IRAs that get you know, sent the wrong way or put in the wrong account. So there's all kinds of, you know, if I look at collectively all the mistakes that happen, yeah, 20%. Uh, uh, Paula, 
Dana and OG doing this with clients. Have you done this just by yourself? Just called them up and, and made the, an, a 401k rollover happen? Yeah, you know, I, I did it. Uh, I had a friend who um, left his job at end of last year, around November or December. And he was like, well, what do I do? You know, I've never been through this before. And so we just sat down. I like looked over the, I, his shoulder as he logged into all of his accounts. And I was like, all right, press that button, press that button, press that. This is what that means. Um, so sometimes just having a, a friend who's knowledgeable about personal finance and who understands what, you know, like, like trustee to trustee transfer, um, you know, knowing someone who understands or can interpret a little piece of jargon like that can be very helpful to somebody who is brand new and has never done any of this before. Did you just do it all online? Different than what yeah. Dana said. Did you, you just, so you didn't talk to anybody? Yeah. Yeah. We just executed everything online, partially through the website and then partially through sending emails to uh, the HR from his former company. And did it go smoothly? Yeah. Everything went, everything went. That's fantastic. You know, back, back in the day, it seemed like if, if the 401k provider was an annuity company, it generally took forever. Oh, geez, that's still the case. Like if you've got a 401k company and it's the same company that represents an insurance company, is it still yeah. generally a bigger problem. Yeah, I would say, you know, there's a lot more technology now, especially especially if you're at some of the bigger firms, you know, think like if Fidelity is managing your workplace 401k, they make it very simple to roll it over to your IRA to the point now where you can just quite often just click the button that says roll it to my IRA and it will done. And because they, you know, they want to make it easy for you to keep it kind of on their platform, you know. Uh, once you get into some other types of custodians, whether it's whether it's a smaller 401k provider um, or or an annuity firm, life insurance company, something like that, they're still, I think, unfortunately, pretty well stuck in the in the uh, 1940s with uh, paper and medallion signature guarantees and you know all sorts of weird esoteric ways to to move money. But that's not even just unique to that. I mean, you can even see some of the new fintech companies that still have some pretty, pretty arcane rules for moving, moving your money to a different place that you want um, it, in, instead of allowing it to be a simple, easy online process, because that's how they process it generally anyway. It's usually done online electronically anyway, but why they make you go through, you know, jump through hoops to get paperwork is, is, is beyond me. It can be a little, is that the a little kind of, bit more challenging. Is that the kind of thing, Paula, that before you roll money over to an IRA, like you kind of look online and see it like how hard is it going to be to get my money out of here? Like, I've never thought about that until OG's talking. I'm like, maybe I just do a quick mm -hmm. Google search ahead of time to see if this is going to be a pain in the ass getting my own money out later. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know exactly what a person would Google. I mean, you could you can certainly Google the name of um your custodian and kind of see if there's like a forum thread about it or something, but there are stories. so many different options out there. And, um, and, and yeah, to your point, Joe horror stories, there's also going to be some sampling bias because the people who have a negative experience are most likely to post about it. So I'm not sure if that's going to be very effective. You know, Dana, um, do you see, though, people make mistakes when they're rolling money over? I, you mentioned one that they might get the check or OG mentioned it was somebody mentioned it earlier. They the check come to them. That's a mistake. Do you see people make other mistakes when they're trying to roll their money over? Well, let me back up for a second, because a lot of the custodians, the 401k providers will require the check go directly to the participant. Now, it can be made payable to the new custodian. So, for example, we custody a Charles Schwab. It might be payable to Charles Schwab for the benefit of, you know, if it was my rollover for the benefit of Dana. But the check is often required to be mailed to the address of record. Uh. And so, you know, then when that check comes, the participant has, you know, 60 days. 
to get it to their new custodian. Uh, there are occasions, but they're still rare, where they will mail the check directly to the new custodian. And I always recommend people pay the extra $25 if it's a substantial amount of money. You know, if it's a couple thousand dollars, you know, maybe you don't pay to have it overnighted. But I saw a half a million dollar 401k check get lost in the mail once, and we had to put a stop payment on it, have it reissued. The original check showed up like 90 days later. <gasps> Oh, wow. By then, you know, we, we'd taken care of it. But, you know, it's just, it's worth the FedEx fee to say, if it's a substantial amount of money, just pay to have it overnighted if it's coming to you or if it can get issued direct to the custodian. And then you you need to be checking. The reason that we caught this one recently that just didn't show up is because every day we were checking the account for the funds. And finally, we, you know, we told the client, like, it should have shown up by now. You really need to get in touch with them. And it was just stuck in the system. Them. No one had given it the green light. $25, just a small insurance policy, right? Mm. Just a tiny one. Oh, gee, you were nodding your head during that. You must have seen that before, too. There's lots of lots of ways to to see this followed up. You know, Paula, you were talking about helping the friend at the end of the year. And I would say that that's probably the biggest one is make sure you give yourself enough time to get it done before something major else is going to happen. And, and something major is a new tax year. You know, there's nothing wrong or illegal with having a rollover happen on December 30th, but the likelihood of it being muddled together with all of the other year end issues that have to happen with IRAs or contributions or conversions. And, you know, the fact that everybody's working at 30% because everybody wants to be out of, out of the office and on vacation. There's just, there's so many ways for it to get messed up. And then you compound it with what if the checks in the mail over that year, right? And, and you think about the, you think about the, uh, the, the, the technical aspect of that. Well, one company says we sent the check, but there's not the corresponding, we got the check in the same tax year, right? Cause there's mm -hmm. the IRS needs to see these two transactions happen to make it a tax free transaction. Right. And so you see one side and you get your, you get your 1099 at the end of the year, it's all gets cleared up, but it's just another hassle. You know, it's, Dana, you were talking about your, you know, your missing rollover check. That money's not going anywhere. It's not going to be, no. it's, it's not, it's not odd. It's just lost. It's, but it's a pain in the butt. Not to mention the fact that you got 90 days of it not being invested, which, you know, could make all the difference, you know, depending on the timing of that. So, you know, try to stack the odds in your favor. You know, if you're going to tackle this, try to get it all done at one time. Try to, try to sit down and do it during, during business time, you know, during business hours. So if you get stuck with a, question you can call the 800 number and actually talk to a person who can you know finalize it for you and uh, and just be aware of other things that are going on you know uh throughout the year different holidays or certainly at the end of the year and like i mentioned before if you've got some some extenuating circumstances like it's an inherited account or you've got company stock or uh you've got multiple different types of contributions, yours and company contributions, and some of yours are pre-tax and some are after tax. These are all things you want to just kind of take your, take an extra second and, 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 and be uh, specific about just to, just to make sure you, you, you have a smooth process. Paula, now I've got all this money sitting here in cash in my new IRA or my new place, maybe the new 401k, whatever it might be. How do I start thinking about redeploying this money? I mean, at that point, it's it's an asset allocation question, asset allocation and asset location question. And uh, that basically means when I say asset location, all right, you've got an IRA. It has a particular type of tax treatment. What other accounts do you have? What kind of tax treatment do those other accounts have? And what kinds of investments do you want to hold across all of your different accounts based on how much money is in there and the tax treatment of each account, right? So you'll want to take a look at this this lump of money uh, in the context of all of your other buckets of money to figure out what types of investments you want to hold in which accounts. Um, yeah. And then as far as the, that's the asset location piece. And then as far as asset allocation goes, which is just a fancy way of saying, how do you want to mix the cocktail, right? You want a little, you want like two shots of vodka, but you also want some. You can tell us Friday for Paula. 
<laughs> right. As as that allocation is just the recipe for your mixed drink. It's the proportions of each ingredient, the amount of vodka, the amount of contrao, the amount of grenadine, the amount of cranberry juice. It's and it's it's the relative proportions of each. Walk us through then, Dana, what she's talking about. Assuming that you agree, how do I start mixing that? How do I start mixing that cocktail? Yeah, well, I'm going to be a little controversial here in that, you know, I know as an industry, we talk about asset allocation in terms of our risk profile, and we define risk as volatility, typically on a year-over-year basis. But me, I'm a fan, like I'm 52 and I'm 100% equity. So if I have at least a 10-year time frame, I'm going to stay 100% equity and go for maximizing returns. And with I'm when I'm within that 10-year window of retirement, which for me, I think the earliest I would retire would be 66. Likely I'll work till 70. But that means, you know, at 56, I will start taking about 10% of my balance and shifting it into, I'm going to actually create a bond ladder at that time. But, but a little differently, you know, if some, if people want to think about really maximizing returns and they're far enough away from retirement, then um, I like to say, you know, be as risky as possible with Within reason, you're still not going to, you know, put all your money in Bitcoin. <laughs> you're going to, you know, still choose an allocation strategy, um, but maybe you're not going to do 60% stocks, 40% bonds. But that's all based on when you're going to take the money out. I mean, based on it everything you said. It is all based on time frame, which is a little different way of looking at it than traditionally our industry will have you fill out a risk tolerance questionnaire. And, I hate that you know, too. It drives it's me crazy. designed to be a CYA for us. And, you know, to me, that's not always in the best interest of the person, depending on their investment experience and their education level and their time frame. There's all kinds of other factors than filling out a risk tolerance questionnaire. Well, my my problem with the risk tolerance questionnaire is is when it gets presented to people. People start off with the risk tolerance. My okay. first question is, what type of risk do you need to take? Like, is there a type of risk that you have to take? If I it, and then the question is, can I accept that risk? I think I feel like we do it. We do it backwards. Oh, gee, yeah, like. Oh, yeah, what's ahead, realistic? Dana. You know, what rates of returns are realistic on the high side or on the low side, depending on what I choose and over what time frames, not just over a single calendar quarter or a single year. Like, how do we get people to think longer term? Like I'm investing for the rest of my life. So that's a different decision than if I'm investing for, for one year. But even over those short terms, I used to like showing people the weather report about we can expect we can expect this bumpy ride like this is what the bumps are going to look like do you think this is going to send you you know this is going to send you uh, on one of Paula's cocktail parties uh, <laughs> <laughs> are you going to have a have a tough time with that or not like that's when I want to get into risk like can you accept the risk of 100% equities because uh, you know OG is singing off that song she too man you're I mean you're all about equities but how do you start walking people through Oh, gee, what the right investments are to use inside of that or that rollover. Well, I think I, I th I'm thinking about this from where we see people make mistakes and where I think people would make mistakes on it would be to say, oh, shouldn't I dollar cost average in? You know, I've got this big bucket of cash mm -hmm. shouldn't I dollar cost average in. And the answer is absolutely no. This was invested five days ago. It needs to be fully invested by nightfall. Just Wait like minute, you that were. was going to be. Yeah, that was going to be my actually my next question was exactly that. And hold on, because I'm going to come right back to you. But I see both Dana and Paula nodding your head. You guys both agree with the fact don't dollar cost average back in, get it, jump in. But Paula. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So if you think about it, by virtue of dollar cost averaging back in, you are going to be disproportionately weighted to cash for way too long. Right. Um, because you're going to be having you're just going to have cash sitting on the sidelines until you get that money in dollar cost averaging makes sense when you're talking about paychecks, because necessarily you can't invest money that you haven't earned yet. So necessarily, you know, I can't invest my paycheck that I will earn six months from now until six months from now. Yeah. Um, but if I already have the money, then throw it all in at once because it's that whole time in the market beats time in the market. 
Oh, gee, I didn't. But, but, but I want to come right back to you. I just wanted to make the point with everybody that all three of you agree on that. And this was a big question I got all the time. Shouldn't I dollar cost average in? Shouldn't I tip? No, absolutely not. But back to you, OG. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was you already were invested yesterday, so why not just be invested again, again today? And 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 now the question is, is what's the you know what's the time horizon of the money? I would argue that um, uh, ten years. I, I think that's even a little too too long. I, I like four or five, you know, like, you know, let's take, let's take advantage of that last double and, and whether it's four or five, 10, it doesn't much matter because it's such a small percentage of your portfolio that needs to be conservative to pay for that next year's income. You know, in, in Dana's example, she's talking about at 56 planning on her 66 years of, 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 of income. What happens and where we, where we see mistakes are people say, well, I'm going to retire at 66. I need the money at 66. It's like, well, no, you need one thirtieth of your money at 66 because I'm planning on you living to be 96. So you still have 30 years for the age 96 money or 40 years. If you're, if you're 56, you know, so you have such a long time for the vast majority of your money that I think this is where we all uh, could have a, could have a lesson in history and say this, this would, the retirement crisis in America would largely be solved if we just stayed invested. It would just, it would just be so much easier, but, but um um, but yeah, take the money, get it invested, move on with life. I'm glad that earlier, uh, uh, Dana, you talked about making sure you check the beneficiaries. A lot of times people open up the new account. They forget to make sure the beneficiaries are correct. Uh, OG and I have shared stories about the ex-spouse getting the, getting somebody's assets when they die. Cause they forgot to check, the, check the beneficiary or worse. They're in their financial planner's office and the financial planner, OG, you've had this happen. Like, so who's, who's Miss Alice, right? Who's, <laughs> oh, oh, wait a minute. Why do you have your ex-wife on there? And then the fight begins right in front of the financial planner, right? Uh, not a, not a great idea. I want to ask you guys, is there an investment type that is a red flag for you inside of an, in a, a rollover that people should go, uh, maybe I need to be a little skeptical about this. Uh, Paula, let's start with you. Any type of investment generally that makes you make you go, uh, you might want to ask a lot of questions. I think if anyone had like a too, too much of their portfolio tilted towards individual stocks, um, you know, that's, but, but, or Bitcoin, you know, um, <laughs> uh, that would probably give me some pause, uh, you know, um, and, uh, any types of funds that had like really excessive fees, uh, Joe, you and I have talked about this. Neither of us believe in um, becoming obsessed with fees the way that some people can be. But if if the fees are like s super egregious, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. That would give me pause. And, and some people, I think people will understand why crypto might not be the best idea. They also the fee argument. I know a lot of people get that. Uh, why not individual stocks? It's it's just it's too much concentrated risk. Um, you know, having a, a small portion of your portfolio that you dedicate towards individual stocks, maybe five percent, maybe ten percent of your overall portfolio uh, that you dedicate to individual stocks, I think is fine. But if you're just betting everything on individual stocks, um, it, you're concentrating risk a little bit too much. Dana, product type you worry about seeing in somebody's rollover? Yeah, you know, the self-directed IRAs where you can invest in private real estate deals, LLCs, that's where I've seen people, including myself, lose the most money. And so the biggest I saw was a client who lost $1.7 million. And oh. so they had moved, you know, rolled over their 401k self-directed IRA custodian where they could invest in an underlying real estate deal. And this was right before 2008. And that whole deal, you know, went under. They eventually, I think they got a couple hundred thousand dollars back 10 years later. And as you're entering retirement, now they've pushed the RMD age out, but you can have an illiquid asset in those self-directed IRAs. And now you have required minimum distributions on that. And, you know, it's a challenge. Um, that's where I, I've had more clients lose money. Me, myself, I had a friend who, you know, I trust her and her husband completely. They were doing this really cool RV park in Florida. And so I did 
did a self-directed IRA and, and invested a, a smaller amount of money, much smaller than $1.7 million. And uh, what happened is their contractor partner got COVID and died. And they didn't have his share of the business. They didn't have the buy-sell in place and, and all of those things. They couldn't finish the deal themselves. They did finally get the deal sold. I got back 60% of what I put in. Um, but it was one of those, I call it asymmetric risk, right? Like, it was a good deal. Their project was solid. They were the right people. But, you know, the business partner that was the main contractor, like, who could have foreseen that? Yeah, and so. Yeah. You know, those are the kind of things where I've seen people, you know, including myself now, really lose the most money. Is it and it's asymmetrical risk because you could have been a lot safer and had a return close to the really nice return you would have had without taking that risk? Is that why it's asymmetrical? Yeah, that's why I would call it asymmetrical. And I couldn't have, you know, as much as I would have thought through the, the deal, I wouldn't have thought to ask, like, you know, what if that contractor dies and did you have insurance in place to buy out his share? You know, I would have just it's, it, I didn't even think to ask that question. We always wonder what we do without Paula and her martini glass analogies here. <laughs> like nobody ever asked that question. So about, uh, about, about time she got back with those. That's, uh, that's why you insure my spa here. That's exactly <laughs> right, right. $25 a week, we pay that premium. Uh, OG, uh, product type that you don't like to see in a rollover or yeah, wonder and, about and, in a rollover. Yeah, anything that's a liquid, Dana already answered this. Basically, you know, if you can't price it on a daily basis, then I don't think that it belongs in your in your retirement accounts. There's too much that can go wrong, whether it's the example that that Dana gave, of course, or or anything else. I mean, it can it can. We've heard really great stories of people who have done this very well, which makes it really sexy. Like uh, most most notably, uh, Peter Thiel putting his PayPal pre IPO shares in his Roth, and now allegedly he has the biggest Roth IRA in existence at something like five or six billion dollars of tax free money. That's that's a great example of asymmetric risk, right? That's that's like I'm either going to be a billionaire tax free or I'm going to lose it all. But but um, but we don't hear about all the ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time where that sometimes or that eventually that eventually blows up. So anything that's a liquid, anything uh, Paula said is high, you know high cost, double taxation benefits are really silly. Like why would you have an annuity inside of an IRA? Um, there's some some very specific reasons for maybe doing that, but but on on par, that's that's you know you're getting tax deferral and then you're paying for tax deferral, which just you know is kind of silly. But um, keep it simple. You know the easiest stuff is the simplest stuff. I'm also thinking when you say not priced every day, it doesn't have to be as far as as Dana went, which was you know the self directed IRA. You're also talking then about like a non traded REIT, right? Yeah. Any, yeah. Non-traded REITs, any private equity deals, um, anything that you can't log in and say, tell me how this did today. Um, because if it's not priced every day, that means it's not going to be liquid every day. And you're going to have to jump through some hoops to try to get your money out. And, um, and the worst thing that can happen is to have that valued on Jan on December 31 at X dollars. Now you have to withdraw, like Dana said, on the, on your required distributions based on that value. But the, but that's just a made up number. And so that's not the real number. And now the actual value is lower than that. And you're starting to withdraw from a, from, you know, from that. It's just no, thanks. I want to be able to buy and sell as I please. And, and there's plenty of diversification and plenty of upside potential, frankly, uh, with publicly traded uh, securities. Guys, thanks a ton for uh, helping all our stackers with with this. This is an area that a lot of people have written us about. So I hope we helped a, a lot of people today. Let's find out what's going on where you guys are. We'll have our guest of honor go last. Uh, OG, what do you got happening Golf. this weekend? Go of course. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> done. done. And, and Doug and I both shaking our head like, what the, Yeah. It's the same answer. I might even time. golf with Doug, as a matter of fact, this oh. next weekend. Well, there you go. You get to watch him, Doug, throw. Did he throw Did he throw a club in the pond or something? I can neither That's confirm nor deny, but it definitely That's wasn't a pond. <laughs> <laughs> right. It might have been something that, but it wasn't a pond. Yeah. might have been a lake. 
No, it was a heavily a forested area, which caused a structural defect in the shaft <laughs> to come forward and reveal itself, thereby snapping the shaft of the club I into multiple pieces. I was putting it in the woods because it was made of wood. It, there was, oh. there was absolutely no natural materials it's involved science. in that it's whatsoever. It's science, Doug. He's, he's saying it's science. It's, yes. Uh, Paula, what's happening on the Afford Anything podcast? So on the Afford Anything podcast, we have a Stanford economist named Nick Bloom, who is talking about work from home. Uh, he actually has been studying remote work since before 9-11. Um, he's been studying it for t- over 20, almost 30 years, back when it used to be referred to as telecommuting. So while it is a new topic in the minds of many. It is for him, and uh, you know, a decades-old topic. So he has the the benefit of historical insight in how um, the the ramifications of work from home uh, in terms of your productivity, creativity, collaboration, how all of that um, plays out. That's interesting. So I'm sure anybody that owns office real estate wants to listen to that show. To see exactly where the, where the future may lie there. Dana, thanks for hanging out with us again. How far did you walk this episode? You know, I am, I think, at a total of about 5,000 steps. You're welcome. Yeah, that's all I have to say is you're welcome. Yeah. What's, Thank what's, you. What's going on at Sensible Money? Tell me what you got coming up. Well, I don't know how much I have coming up at work, but I'll tell you, I think last time I was on, I had just started playing pickleball and I have become a pickleball playing machine. I've joined the JW Marriott Pickleball Club and I played for two hours this morning. I am a pickleball playing, you know, it's just every spare minute now I'm, I'm loving it. That is, that's by the way, is sweeping Texarkana right now. Like all of my friends are getting into pickleball, like everybody. Uh, a good friend of mine last week, we were we were at our workout in the morning and he's like, I play pickleball for the first time yesterday. I get it. I see why everybody loves it. I love it. It's you know, we go out, we drill, we practice. I have a ladies group and then we have a couples group we go with. It's it's a lot of fun. If somebody wants to email you, they want to know more about working with you. Where do they find you, Dana? Dana at sensiblemoney.com or visit our website, sensiblemoney.com. There's a ton of info and free reports to download. And we'll link to Sensible Money. We'll also link to Afford Anything on our show notes at stackybenjamins.com. That's going to do it for today, except for one thing, Doug. We, we had a lot of takeaways, but what do you think our top three should be? Joe, I think of the top three, first, take some advice from our panel and do your homework and preparation before you roll over your 401k. Maybe the right answer is to stay where you are, or maybe it's to use an IRA. You'll make the right decision if you know what your goal is, and you've heard it here before, begin with the end in mind. Second, once you decide to do a rollover, you'll need to stay on top of it to make sure things are moving along. Hiccups throughout the process aren't unusual, like the time they lost my half million dollar check. Thanks for that out in the open, Dana. But the big lesson... Don't forget to check the gas gauge when you're tooling around town. It's a little embarrassing having to ask Joe's mom to help you push your car out of an intersection you've driven through 20 times in a night. Not that, you know, that's ever happened to me last Tuesday. Thanks to Dana for joining us today. You can find more work from Dana at sensiblemoney.com. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Thanks to Paula Pant for joining us today. You can find her amazing podcast, Afford Anything, wherever finer podcasts are sold. Thanks also to OG for joining us today. Looking for good financial planning help? Head to stackingbenjamins.com slash OG for his calendar. You know, Joe, this part of the credits is so important to me, I had to go put on my favorite shirt. Let's do this. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Salcihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show was written by Joe Salcihai with help from me, Doc G from the Earn and Invest Podcast, and Lacey Langford from the Military Money Show. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. 
Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude and Kate Youngkin are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. I, I, it, while I was ad libbing that second takeaway and I was trying to talk about my half million dollar check, I was somehow I got twisted up in my metaphors and I was going to say shedding light on. And all I said was shedding. And I think it's going to sound like she shed, like she was <laughs> sh <laughs> that story. <laughs> I'm like, oh, God, I can't undo it. I can't fix it now. I'm just going to keep going. So if Steve ends up bleeping out that word, I will not blame him or you. That's good, Steve. Do it. Just, but we, we did an episode a few years ago where we just bleeped out random words for fun. Bleep random words. It's awesome. <laughs> and, that, and that was hilarious. We just Could went you through still it. understand it? We could, but it sounded... We would bleep out a word where... We said something that was no big deal, and it made the whole show sound dirty. <laughs> it was pretty, pretty fun.